Welcome to Polyface Farm, the farm of many faces, where our mission is to develop emotionally, economically, and environmentally enhancing agriculture enterprises and facilitate their duplication throughout the world. We're entering our third generation as an environmentally friendly family farm, passionately promoting the reality that we can have production, profit, and pleasure along the Integrity Way. Centrally located on the western edge of Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, the farm has 100 open acres, 450 forested acres, and produces salad bar beef, pastured poultry, pastured turkey, forage-based rabbits, pigerator pork, pastured eggs, and forestry products, all the while supporting four full-time salaries. In the next few minutes, you'll see the main players at Polyface, Joel, Teresa, Daniel, Rachel, and Lucille, and other family, apprentices, and friends who contribute to making this a regenerative, symbiotic niche of God's creation. This is the feather net where we have a thousand chickens in a quarter acre circle of electrified netting. This is a fairly new material and uh, the netting keeps predators out and keeps the chickens in. But the beauty of this model is that it allows us to use it in symbiosis with the cows so that we can plop this completely protected uh, area for the chickens uh, into an existing beef cattle, sheep, dairy, grain, hay operation and the cows don't come in and, uh, and mess up the nest boxes which are hanging in these hoop structures. Everything is hooked together by a chain. These feed sleds are hooked together so you just hook up to the front with the tractor and pull the whole thing at one time. The watering system is uh, hanging right on the end of the, of the uh, feed sled and that's all hooked into our pressurized water system so there's no feed to carry, no water to carry, and enough feed volume is uh, held there for approximately three weeks at a time. And then the cattle can, can prepare the uh, table for the chickens so that it'll be short grass and not real long. The bottom line on the model is that one person working seven hours a week on five acres can net $10,000 a year. So now we're going to move the birds up into the next paddock. What we do here is we open up, we've got two contiguous circles here, the old circle where they were and the new circle where we're going to move them. We move the tractor through the, through the waste, if you will, uh, like an hourglass through the waste. And you notice how the birds learn very quickly and they come right into the, right into the next paddock. See, they're already moving in here and we move it real slow so we don't run over anybody. And, um, and just the whole thing just skids into the next paddock. The beauty of this is the chickens are always under control. They can never get lost or get away from us. And the hoop structure can't roll anywhere. Another advantage of this is that we can come right in here with the cows and graze ahead or behind this, all around this in the field, and it's already cow proof. So now the move is essentially complete and the whole thing has just taken us a few minutes. And the birds have a, a, completely, fresh, a completely fresh salad bar now for the next couple, three days. Here we are at the skid houses. This is where we brood the chicks the first three weeks of their lives. We have two skid houses and two chalets. The skid houses are 12 by 20 and the chalets are 12 by 12. We do all of our birds here, our broilers, our pullets, our turkeys. In this particular one, we have our broiler chicks. Here we are in the skid house. Uh, there's a thousand broiler chicks here. There's a partition, as you notice, running right through the middle of the skid house. That is to part the two groups. So there's 500 in each section. So if they get excited or chilly or whatever reason, 
they don't all go to a corner and smother each other where there's a less chance of it happening with 500 than a thousand. Here's our hover right here. The heat lamps hang down through the middle. This is to keep them warm. It keeps all the hot air in there. They like it about 95 degrees so you can't heat a whole skin house always. Um, these bags <clears throat> are to keep the more heat in. We normally don't have them on, but since it is our first batch and it's still chilly early in the season, we like to keep more heat and things in. This is our feed. We have, most of it is corn, oats, uh, wheat, and fur trails, uh, Nutribalancer ration. We give them grit the first uh, about a week of their life here. That is to get their gizzard going, get them started eating uh, solid foods. Then we have our waterer hanging over there in the corner. That we give the big waterer to them about a week after they're here because they can't reach it when they're teeny. They need something smaller. So we have gallon jugs um, that sit on little blocks, basically scraps to keep them up from the bedding, so no chips, manure, dirt, whatever gets into the clean water. We put in fresh bedding after every batch when these go out, and we also clean the gallon jugs. You'll probably see those later. And you probably see no bucket here because it is gravity fed from, there's a bucket on top of this, this building that gravity feeds down into it. And then three weeks after they're in here, they go out on pasture. Probably the signature enterprise at Polyface Farm is the pastured broiler enterprise. Every farm has its, has its centerpiece and its ancillary enterprises. And for us, probably our centerpiece enterprise is the pastured broiler. We started this back in about 1983, in the fall of that year, and uh, it has grown progressively since. In the first year, we did about 300, and then 400, and then 800, and it has grown up to where in the year 2000, we did about 12,000 pastured broilers. And the idea here is that you're, you're using meat chickens in portable pens, portable floorless pens, and moving them across the pasture so they get a fresh, clean salad bar every single day. They're moved away from yesterday's excrement onto today's fresh uh, forage and fresh lounge area. And the result is that we get a bird that eats a tremendous amount of green material, a lot of small groups so there's no stress from being in a great big mob, fresh air, fresh sunshine, and green grass, and these are all things that are denied 99% you know, of the birds in America. We make a great differentiation between pastured poultry and free range poultry, which typically has a non-rotated yard. In, in wild, in the nature, everything needs to be moved, go to a fresh spot for sanitation, for you know, good production, for cleanliness and hygiene and fresh uh, forage or fresh vegetable material, fresh salad bar. And so that's the idea here, is that we're moving these pens daily to a fresh salad bar. Chore time every day involves, of course, moving the pens and carrying feed and water to each pen. We don't use a machine to do this because it, it uh, scares the birds and they panic and run around when you get around them with machinery and noise. And so we just walk gently from pen to pen. We keep our feed and water here close to the pens and, and service the pens uh, like that. When the birds start, when they're real small, it only takes one servicing a day. The servicing takes roughly five minutes per pen per day. It takes one minute to move a pen, so we can move 50 pens in 50 minutes. Tool time just simply doesn't take that long. And to get the birds on fresh, clean salad bar every single day, the movement is certainly not the time-consuming part. And what we have then, of course, is a bird that's, uh, that's highly saleable and different than something that's on a non-rotated pasture. The pens are 12 feet long, 10 feet wide, and two feet high, which is roughly as big as we can move by hand. If you make them any bigger or heavier, then 
you'll get a hernia trying to move them. And so we have made them as big as is practicable to move them by themselves. If you make them smaller, then you're moving a lot fewer pins for the same procedure. And uh, we use lumber because we, that's just what we have and we've always worked with lumber. You've got three quarters of the, of the top is, uh, is roofed. The feeder, the feeder is under the roof so if it rains, it's protected from uh, rain runoff. The water is on the open quadrant. The open quadrant gives the birds a lot more light and the, and the pins are situated with the closed end running toward the weather, toward the west, so that our, our weather comes from the westerly, so that protects it from the weather. And the southern, the southern aspect always has this open quadrant so the light penetrates as far into the pin as possible. And uh, people can, you know, people have made these A-frame style out of uh, PVC pipes. You know, the point is that you're, you're breaking the chickens up into very small groups, highly portable pins that you can move every day very easily, and then it's enjoyable to move them rather than busting your guts trying to move a heavy pin. You can notice where we move them every day. You can see the fresh spots every day, and on a normal season, it takes about seven days for the old spot to, uh, to fertilize and of course for the new grass to come up. So that's what we talk about when we say pasture, they're on a completely fresh pasture spot and it's that freshness that stimulates the ingestion from the bird. If they were on here, if they had all of this area for more than one day, they would take the ice cream the first day and then they'd be down to liver and onions the next day and they wouldn't ingest the amount of green material which has the vitamins, the minerals, the, the carotenes and, and all those things that, that make the poultry good. They wouldn't ingest as much of that if they were moving, if they were all on the same area and not moved to a, to a, a fresh spot every single day. Not only that, but they would lounge in the same area and then they'd be lounging back on this same, on this same excrement. Now the beauty of this system is, as you can see the infrastructure, I mean all we have are, are the pins, and then the byproduct of the pins moving across the pasture is fertility for the soil to grow better grass for the cows. And so one of the most exciting aspects of this whole model to us is that it allows a person to have a white collar salaried enterprise as a complementary non-competitive enterprise on dad and mom's farm, grandpa's farm, a neighbor's farm, a friend's farm. It's a way in for a wannabe or a young person. It's a way for an elderly farmer to have a young generation build a complementary enterprise on the existing land base without jeopardizing the existing dairy or beef or sheep or, or whatever the, the, the basic, um, the older person's enterprise is. And that's probably one of the most exciting aspects now from an agricultural aspect is that we're seeing people do these successful pastured poultry operations on land that they either rent or have some access to. You don't have to own it. You can start your agricultural life um, and what a great office to work in. You can start that without owning any land at all. We, we run about 500 broilers per one acre. In other words, these chickens come out as about 14 to 15 to 16 days old, depending on season, weather, those kinds of things. And then they're moved every day. So in the course of that five week period, we dress them at eight weeks. So in the course of that period, those every 500 birds will cover roughly one acre. So for 12,000 birds, we need roughly 24 acres. And we start the season sometime uh, we can come out with chicks here in Virginia, of course, every part of the country is a little bit different, but here in the Shenandoah Valley, we can usually come out with chickens, uh, the first batch about the second week in April, something like that, and then we conclude with the very last batch about the first week in October before it really uh, turns cold. So that's the way the season progresses, and it is, it's completely seasonal. The six months of winter time then, we have no pastured broilers at all. Everything shuts down, so it's a six months on, six months off, 
and during that six month period at 500 birds per acre at a net of three dollars per bird that gives us a net profit of fifteen hundred dollars per acre in the six month period so this is a means of where just covering very small acreages we can get tremendous uh, income per acre These are the Eggmobiles, two portable hen houses, 12 feet by 20 feet, hooked together like a train. There are 500 birds in each one, and uh, these are black astralorps, so there's a thousand birds here. Of, uh, these are non-hybrid, old American uh, variety, but we move these birds every day to a fresh uh, spot behind the cows. So the cows are in, they drop their manure, which becomes an incubator for pathogens and parasites. So the chickens, the birds, follow the cows in the rotation, just like birds in nature, like the egret on the rhino's nose. It's a symbiotic relationship. The birds sanitize behind the herbivores. And so every morning, we move the chickens about, um, we keep them about three to four days behind the cows because that's the fly cycle. They spread the cow patties into the, into the ground to stimulate nutrient cycling. As a byproduct of sanitizing the pastures, they just lay eggs. And that turns a liability into an asset. They turn grasshoppers, crickets, and all the things that would be negatives into a cash product. And it's all ecologically friendly, and it makes a great place for a chicken to live. So while everybody else is spending thousands of dollars shooting their cows up with grubicides and wormers and systemic parasiticides that make the meat so bad it kills all the bugs, we just collect thousands of dollars worth of eggs as a byproduct of the pasture sanitation program. So uh, these, are, these chickens are laying in nest boxes that are accessible from the outside. We'll open this up and see where the chickens are working here. And uh, each of, each of these uh, individual nests has eggs in it. Of course, we gather them once a day, but uh, these are the these these are the cash. These are the cash value that those chickens are taking all of the parasites and the grubs and the crickets and the grasshoppers and turning them into cash. And so that what's beautiful about this is that we can show how we can make taking care of our environment and the ecological principles make economic sense. And that's always been my contention that the best ecology is always also the best economics. And so the chickens are doing all the work and enjoying it and it makes the world's best egg as a byproduct. As an example of how the chickens scratch through the cow patties, eat out the fly larvae, and, and spread the, the cow patties into the ground, we have one right here that's a, that's a good example. And you can see here how the chickens have scratched through it and, and they have sanitized it. Uh, it's, it's spread wide. The chickens have even uh, left their calling card to show that they have been here uh, on the middle of it. But this is a perfect picture of the symbiosis and the synergism that occurs when we have multiple complementary species working together rather than buying in pharmaceuticals and toxic materials from outside. We're letting animals do the work uh, in a complementary way and it makes environmental, ecological, and economic sense. On the Eggmobile, of course, when we move it every day, it's important to, to think of efficiency. If we're going to have a thousand chickens here out in the fields, we need to think of efficiency. So again, we have, we have um, over 300 feet of, of water line on here. This is a 3 8 inch air hose, which we can get a lot more of that on one of these uh, little reels than you can a, a garden hose. So we can plumb that into our water system line, and then that just goes to a, to a little, um, a little float valve on a water pan that keeps nice fresh water in front of the chickens all day long and uh, everything stays clean and there's no water to carry. Very, very efficient and very uh, animal friendly and clean and hygienic. In the morning after I, after I move the uh, Eggmobile, all that I have to do for chores is, uh, of course we carry, we carry a lot of 
feed here on these uh, barrels, and each Eggmobile carries a half a ton of feed with it. So uh, all I have to do is dip a little feed and uh, put it in a supplemental feeder inside. After moving them in the morning, then of course we hook up the water system and then we uh, dip out some feed and give the feed in an extra feeder because they need additional linear uh, footage because a chicken's metabolism is so high, they need a lot of linear footage so that many of them can belly up to it at the same time. Of course, this feed is uh, grain that's non-genetically engineered. We get it from uh, local farmers right here. And uh, so we give them feed and then we open up the, uh, the nest boxes which have been closed up during the night so the chickens don't roost in there because wherever a chicken roosts, she drops her calling card and we don't want that soiling on the eggs. So it keeps the eggs cleaner. So we have to open those nest boxes so the birds can get in. Now in the evening, when the chickens uh, all go in, they, they all go in as it starts to get dark because they're afraid of predators and things. We come up and uh, pull off the uh, ramp and just drop the door and latch it. And now the chickens are protected from predators for the night and they're locked in so that we can move them wherever we need to move them so they'll function behind the cows like they're supposed to. We have a feeder, a self feeder, hanging on the back of the Eggmobile so that it holds a thousand pounds of feed and the feed just tumbles down as the chickens eat out of it and uh, this way it self feeds them for about three weeks at a time and reduces chore time. The asset of the Eggmobile of course is that it produces our best, our highest quality egg at the cheapest cost. And each one of these houses will net 20 bucks a day, net. That's $40 a day uh, times seven days a week is $280 a week net off of just this. We don't know that we have the completely right combination, but the basic idea is one of symbiosis and synergism. Again, multiple use on the landscape. We have four quadrants. It's a quarter acre, so each quadrant is a sixteenth of an acre. It's 100 feet by 100 feet, and each quadrant is 50 by 50. And each quadrant then has 12, uh, 12 grapevines growing in it, which are protected by wire screen. And then what we do is we run the turkeys in here and the, the trellis poles that hold up the, the grapes act as a, as a pole also to hold up the netting up above us to keep predators uh, from coming in to protect the, the young turkeys. These turkeys are not too far from being dressed and uh, we move them from quadrant to quadrant as, as they progress. That the animals uh, harvest the grass, they essentially mow it and fertilize it and debug it, sanitize it for the grapes. As the grapes grow up taller and, and bigger, they will provide shade and shelter for whatever animals we have in here. But the turkeys have not touched the grape, grape vines, even though we pushed them kind of hard experimentally just to see if they will eat the leaves, and they don't seem to. So it seems like turkeys are gonna be uh, a good combination here. But, but the, the whole idea here is that in this quarter acre, uh, as the combination comes out right, we should, with the combination of, of uh, rabbits, or maybe not rabbits at all, just the turkeys and just the vineyard, maybe something small like, like lambs, you know, eventually. Uh, but the idea is that with the combination of things, this quarter acre should net uh, four to $5,000 per year. And when you can net, four to five thousand dollars a year on a quarter acre that is extremely intensive uh, production and of course everything working together keeps it clean sanitary fertilized and an enjoyable place to work there are significant differences between raising the turkeys and raising the broilers the main difference is to start of course the poults are a lot more expensive than the little broiler chicks but beyond that the poults require more heat they're much more fragile to get started than the chicks. And so in the brooding house, we need to keep the temperature just a little bit hotter 
and be much more cautious about no uh, um, breezes just ventilation yes but no direct breezes on the pulse we use uh, little uh, cardboard you know rings so there are no corners we really have to baby them more than the little chicks they stay in longer in the brooder they stay in instead of just staying in for 14 to 15 16 days they stay in a full four weeks and at four weeks then they can come out in the broiler pens for three or four weeks and then uh, they can come either in the broiler pens or maybe in a barn or you know some sort of a protected protected shelter uh, but they're still very vulnerable at four weeks. They'll still they'll still drown in a in a afternoon thunderstorm in July just as easy as anything. So you'll be very careful about putting them out too early. And then along about week eight, it seems like the turkey uh, goes into overdrive, and and then you can't kill them with a stick. Once they get to this stage, they just seem almost uh, completely invulnerable to anything weather that you can throw at them. And so then when they get big though, they do like to range a lot more than the broilers. And so putting them in this uh, situation allows them a lot more freedom, a lot more range, a lot more bugs and grazing. And then we can just move them through these uh, quadrants and, um, and graze them with, with more area. We raise the turkeys, we normally dress them about to about 16 weeks, and that gives us about a, uh, anywhere from a 13 to a 16 pound carcass. We found that there are customers who like a carcass over 20 pounds, but most people don't know what to do with a turkey over 20 pounds. Most people want about a 13, 14, 15 pound turkey. Eight pounds is really too small to let the turkey enjoy its full you know, physiological expression. So 16 weeks is about uh, what we try to run them. And uh, another, another big uh, difference is that their feed, when they start, these poults need 28% protein. Chicks are perfectly happy at 18, 19%. So we beef up the ration quite a lot with uh, roasted soybean meal. And we feed them a lot of boiled eggs, uh, cracked eggs from our feather nets and the egg mobiles and things like that. We just uh, uh, hard boil them and just mash them and, and throw them in pans in the brooder house. And that way the chickens get this, I mean the turkeys, the little poults get this wonderful uh, supplement um, to, to bolster their protein and you can pretty much give them all of that they want. The other final big difference is they need a lot of grit. Uh, chickens, minimal grit, you know, we, we get them started and that's about enough, but the turkeys actually need heavy big rocks the size of marbles for their digestion and for proper, uh, for, for proper work of their gizzard. But uh, the one big advantage of the turkey, of course they are seasonal, you know, they, they tend, to, tend to grow most of them for the Thanksgiving market, but uh, beyond that the processing is much simpler because you're dealing with a much larger animal doing about the same thing. We can't go as fast numerically, but we can go about twice as fast on poundage. And since you're getting paid on poundage, the turkeys become much more efficient in processing. So even though the production end is twice as long, cash flow is harder, they're harder to start and all that, still uh, they end up being just as lucrative and economically beneficial as chickens in as much as the processing is twice as uh, is twice as efficient. So we enjoy the turkeys and um, our customers certainly do and we produce uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 turkeys a year and we produce them starting early in the spring and produce them year round uh, along with the along with the broilers because we have customers that like turkey more than chicken and so they we have them then year round uh, for, for folks. Once the turkeys hit about 10 weeks to this, to this uh, indestructible stage, then we can move them out in a pretty uh, open weather type situation, a range type situation like, like the binary here. Daily requirements here, basically keep, them, keep some feed in the feeders, uh, make sure these buckets have water in them. Um, they, of course, they're the same ones that are in the broiler pens. The water just uh, comes down gravity fed. And uh, other than that, the turkeys are pretty much on their own to move around and eat whatever grass they want, uh, um, eat the feed they want, and just continue to grow up and get fatter.
When we talk about grass growth, the grass growth cycle, the nutrient cycle in the pasture, the whole thing keys on timing and access of the animals and, and the multitude of different animals to the grass sward. For example, we're right now in a paddock that the cows had grazed just three days ago. And if you'll notice in the ruler, this uh, grass is relatively short. And the, the cut level was right here at this spot. So now it has sent forth these new shoots. Well, obviously, these shoots, which are roughly two inches long in three days, these shoots are very grazable. If we graze these shoots before they have replaced the energy in the roots that was expended in sending forth the shoots, and of course they're going to replace the energy with, you know, photosynthetically, if we regraze this too early, we're going to weaken that grass plant. And so that's why we only want to allow the cattle to graze one time and then move them off so that they can't regraze before that plant reaches energy equilibrium and becomes weaker. In good growing conditions, after only about a week to 10 days, the grass really begins to kick in its exponential growth curve. It starts to hit that, what we call the adolescent uh, growth cycle. And this is the very beginning of it here. And of course you notice the ground becomes covered more and uh, the energy equilibrium gets replaced in those, in those plants. And if we graze that grass too early, of course, we're going to weaken it. And if we wait until it gets that uh, energy replaced, the growth will be exponentially more productive and will actually collect far more solar energy per square foot than we would if we allowed the animals continuous access so they continued to nip the grass in its infancy. Once the grass has regrown enough to replace that energy in the roots, it is actually ready to graze. And uh, once it hits about six, seven, eight inches, it depends, different species, it's a different amount, but the principle is what's important. The principle is that every species has a growth curve, a, a biological S growth curve. We don't want to graze infant grass and we don't want to let it get so old that it turns into dormancy and lignifies. If we graze it, at its most nutritional level, it will also be at its most productive state. It will be sequestering the most uh, carbon. It will be replacing the most energy in the, the roots. It will have collected the most solar energy. Uh, and it will be the most efficient for the cow to graze because the cow likes to harvest about four to six inches per, per mouthful. And so all of these wonderful factors kick in when we only allow limited access and the appropriate amount, amount of rest period between the grazing cycles. When we talk about salad bar, what we're talking about is a perennial polyculture. Now if you look here, for example, here's, here's some orchard grass. This is fescue. This is some Carolina nightshade. Here's red clover. Here's white clover. Here's some, uh, some narrow leaf plantain, which is a, a medic, a, a blood cleanser, if you will. There's some, uh, there's some narrow uh, dock here, a little bit of dock weed. And here's some uh, Queen Anne's lace, wild carrot. It's considered a weed, but when it's like this, it's extremely tender, and the cows, the cows will eat it like uh, cotton candy. So as, so here, you know, in my hand now, I'm holding, I'm holding this, this multiplicity of species, and there are probably more here that I, that I can't see. But you notice that it's highly vegetative, and this is, of course, what we're trying to feed the cows, the chickens, and everything else is a, is what we call an adolescent type, uh, uh, a puberty quality young, vegetative, virile, healthy, nutritious um, salad bar. It's, it's fresh every day. The cows get it every day. The chickens get it every day. Um, and, and when it's in this vegetative state, they, they eat a tremendous amount of it because of its highly palatable, it's, it's all ice cream. And every one of these different plants fills a different niche above the ground, below the ground, and the animal's nutritional profile. So the, 
the diversity and the polyculture is all part of that uh, healthy ecosystem below the ground, above the ground, and the diet that we eat. Our water system comes from a pond at the foot of the mountain and uh, that gravity feeds so there's no electric pumps, there's no uh, uh, pressure tanks or anything like that. It just comes by gravity down here to where we use it for the livestock. We use it for the pigs, for the chickens, for the cattle, for anything, you know, anything that happens down here at the farm. We have about three miles of uh, three-quarter inch polyethylene black plastic pipe and uh, every 200 feet is a T with a little $1 hardware store uh, valve. So we have 80 pounds of static pressure, 80 PSI water every few feet anywhere on the farm. So you just open up a valve and uh, you've got pressurized water anywhere. When we look at the big picture dealing with the landscape, what we're trying to do is to take that landscape and fashion it uh, so that there is homogeneity within paddocks. Now that where the environments intersect between open land, forest land, and water are generally on what we call, uh, after, the, after the great Australian, uh, key line systems, PA Yeomans, key line systems, or uh, just the break point between a ridge and a slope or a slope and a swale. Those, the swale, the slope, and the ridge are all extremely important defining factors in aspect, where, in other words, how it faces toward the sun. And then, of course, that aspect has everything to do with how it dries out or gets wet and stays wet and what kind of speciation it has, what kind of natural species want to, want to live there. And so the fence here, which actually runs along this break point, separates this slope and ridge from this steep north slope. The reason that's important is because in the north slope, the soil tends to stay damp and much deeper and cooler, more moist. In the slope, the south slope and the ridge, the soil tends to be much drier and hotter. And so in a drought situation, obviously the north slope will grow longer than a south slope. In the early spring, the south slope facing the sun, drying out earlier, that grass tends to green up earlier and be ready to graze a much earlier than the, the boggy, dampy uh, north slope. Now we tend to uh, use these uh, break points where, for the edge effect uh, in order to identify the, the forest, where the forest is going to be on the north slope, which grows better forest, the south slope grows better grass. But the, the main point I want to make here is that we let the terrain, not our ideas of square fields, but actually let the terrain and the topography speak to us and identify where the field, where the actual permanent fences, the field break points need to run. Once we get that figured out, then everything else uh, kind of falls into place. We know where the fields are, we know where the forests are, we know where the riparian areas are, and we can adjust our management plan accordingly. But it all starts by identifying these breakpoints. Now we're on the other side of that slope. And as we come down the slope, notice the trees, and then it comes into a pond into the bottom of the swale. This is a typical terrain type uh, situation where you've got a break point at the top of a hill, a steep slope down to the bottom, and then the bottom tends to be pretty boggy or marshy. This used to be an old marsh, and so we have pushed it out and actually built a pond here. This pond, of course, can be used for irrigation, for uh, livestock water, for recreational fishing, uh, caged aquaculture, any number of, of uh, profit center aquaculture type enterprises. But here again, uh, we have a fence on the, other, on the other side of this swale, just like we had a fence up on the ridge and the, uh, and the slope coming down here. Now we have a fence here to keep the cows from being able to walk into the pond. 
One of the worst things we can do from an environmental and a livestock hygiene standpoint is to allow those cows to actually step right into the pond. What happens when they do that is they actually push the actually push the sides of the pond down so that instead of a steep bank we have a very gentle bank into the pond and a steep bank tends to minimize the growth of algae and uh, and crab grasses and things like that now if we move off of the of the direction into the field we'll see another field essentially just like that southern slope that we were where we were a little bit ago and this of course southern slope comes down into a bo into the to the bottom into the swale and so again if we allowed the cows access to both areas at once if the slope were uh, were damp the marshy ground of course would be completely boggy and they'd be standing in mud so it is the it is the fence it is running the fence defining that landscape letting the terrain the swale the slope and the ridge allowing that terrain to identify where the edge of the fields need to be. Another major enterprise here at Polyface is salad bar beef. I coined the term several years ago to explain the difference between our beef and pretty much everything that's available in the supermarket. The supermarket paradigm is that the beef is finished on grain in a feedlot with a lot of fecal particulate, whereas our beef is finished right here. These animals actually go right from here, right to the slaughterhouse, off of the salad bar, which is the diversified mix of forages that come by mimicking natural herbivore patterns in nature. If you study herbivores in nature, you notice two primary principles. One is they're always moving. They're always moving away from yesterday's lounge and campsite area to, to new forage. They're following the, you know, the rains or the whatever. And then they're always mobbed up and that's for protection because over in the brush there's some you know, lion or tiger or something. And when we mimic those two principles of movement and mobbing in a domestic way, suddenly all sorts of things happen in, the, in the, the soil, the plants, the nutrient cycle, and the nutrition of the, of the uh, animal. When we came in 1961, for example, we could walk across these fields and never set foot on a grass plant. We could, we could just walk on dirt. And as we have done this management grazing, succession has pushed the sward tighter together. It has thickened it up because the, the physiology and the interaction of the, of the cow and the grass in this kind of management creates a successional level that actually stimulates the thickening of the sward. Now by moving the cows essentially every single day to a fresh salad bar, we're able to keep them on highly vegetative grass as opposed to grass that's, that's uh, too immature or some of the unpalatable species that are extremely uh, over mature, physiologically mature. Either one of those extremes, what we call infant grass or nursing home grass, either one of those extremes is not healthy for the stock, it's not healthy to capture as much solar energy, it's not healthy for earthworms, it's not healthy for the plant. Whereas by keeping the grass at, at a kind of a uh, a teenage, an adolescent growth stage at this rapid growth stage, that gives us the highest nutritional plane of the plant. It allows us to capture the most solar energy and sequester the greatest amount of carbon in the soil, in the soil bank, and it keeps the grass at its most virulence and most productive. Bottom line, in Augusta County, the average cow days per acre on pasture averages 70 cow days per acre in this county. We average here about 250 cow days per acre, and we've had paddocks go over 400 cow days per acre, and we haven't planted a seed or put on a bag of fertilizer in 40 years. It works. The weak link in agriculture, the weak link in your profit margin and my profit margin is not necessarily genetics, seeds, equipment, tools, or the latest greatest. The weakness is management. And as we mimic the natural herbivore grazing patterns with our domestic stock, all the beautiful natural principles of succession and, and earthworm activity, 
and porosity of the soil and the cycles, all of that kicks in to, uh, to create a wonderful successional atmosphere and allow us to produce uh, a more abundance per acre and a much higher quality uh, beef that will actually make you healthy instead of making you sick. And that's the bottom line for us is, is uh, producing something that actually helps people and that we don't have to apologize for or hire slick public relations people to, uh, to create slick uh, phraseology and cliches to market. It actually uh, is healthy and we can make people healthy as well. And that's healthy for the farm, for the soil, and for the livestock. Now we're going to move cows. That phrase raises all sorts of uh, strange ideas in, in uh, livestock producers' minds. Uh, too often, of course, when you say we're going to move cows, they think of uh, two four-wheelers, three cans of skull snuff, two pickup trucks, a lot of spitting and cussing, and they probably still have one stuck back in the brush somewhere. When we say move cows, we just mean walk out, give them a call, and let them follow us into the next paddock. What we're going to do is we're going to move these uh, cows from the paddock where they are today or yesterday and move them into the new paddock. We try to move them every day around 4 o'clock and that allows them to have that full night of, of grazing, especially in the summertime. It allows them to have the maximum grazing time before the hot sun in which they'd want to uh, quit grazing and go find a, a place to, to lounge. All we're doing is mimicking the natural pattern. The electric fence allows us to control the animals. That's our, our steering wheel, accelerator, and brake on that four-legged mowing machine. And so the electric fence, which is portable, we can, we can make and unmake. We can make bigger paddocks, smaller paddocks, depending on the number of animals. This happens to be about 85 head on uh, a little over a quarter of an acre. And so that's a one day's allotment. The grass is, is pretty lush and long. We're in the fall. The, the uh, cows are beginning to dry off. And so uh, we're very small paddocks, high utilization, and this is their daily break. So every day they get that fresh ice cream, that fresh, highly palatable, de vegetative, green material. And then uh, when we actually, when we dress the animals, when we go to the slaughterhouse, we actually pull the animals directly right off of the pasture, take them right to the uh, butcher. The point is, there is no reason under this kind of intensive management, mimicking the natural patterns in nature, there is no reason to ever feed grain to an herbivore. That's why God gave them four stomachs. We, the, the forage is what's right for their uh, rumen, for their fermentation process. We don't have to worry about E. coli because the the uh, digestive juices are balanced in the, in the gut, and by moving them every day, we keep the forage at a, what I call an adolescent stage. We don't want, we don't want nursing home grass, and we don't want diaper grass. We want that virulence and that fast growth in the middle of the S curve of adolescence. And so by grazing it, mimicking the natural patterns, we can keep that grass at an adolescent growth, uh, growth curve with all of the nutrition and the virulence and the, the strength and the, and the productivity of, uh, of adolescence. Here we are at the Yugo, a portable sheep corral. We got into sheep to mimic nature, the pronged horn antelope of nature. We had the bison in the cattle and the poultry in the form of the chickens, but we didn't have the antelope section. So to fill that, we brought in the sheep. They eat a completely different species than the cattle and can be brought in to, with a cattle and poultry enterprise and not even know that they're there because they're eating something completely different. They're in a 20 by 20 portable corral that's both predator proof and obviously they can't get out. It's made out of uh, PVC, it's one by sixes and 14 gauge welded wire. And this is a completely R&D project for us, so we're not exactly sure how it's gonna look like in a couple years, but this is how we've started. Where they, we get, they get uh, a free choice mineral, which is NutriBalancer, all they'll eat. 
Uh, the 25 U's in here will get uh, drink 10 gallons of water a day, roughly. We have a rough uh, shelter for them that provides shade during the summertime, and these sides flop down during the winter to provide shelter and windbreak in the wintertime. But this is just for the ewes, and the lambs after they're weaned get moved to the Lamborghini. It can be moved by hand or with a four-wheeler. So this corral is moved with a tractor or four-wheel drive truck every single day to a fresh spot and can hold about 20 to 25 lambs at a time. It's fall, the birds have been moved into the greenhouse for their winter housing, and the rabbits have been moved in as well. Adding rabbits to a farm business is an easy animal to add because the rabbits don't require a lot more building or housing. These rabbits here are using the same roof structure and the same floor space as the chickens. And they're not taking up, there's not a lot of infrastructure to house them. So these rabbits here can be added to the farm business without having to build a lot more buildings. The rabbits, these are meat rabbits. They're, they can be New Zealand whites, Californians, any type of meat rabbit. These are Californian, Dutch, and New Zealand crosses. And I've been breeding rabbits for uh, 12 years. I started when I was nine years old with just three does and a buck and have moved to 80 to almost 100 does in that period of time. The reason we got into rabbits is A, they were easy to add. We had a market for them and they per the rabbits are famous for their high nitrogen and great uh, byproducts in use in worm beds and, and things like that and can be spread on the pasture and are great ways to help increase the um, organic matter in the ground. And so we use the rabbits to help produce compost to help uh, increase the quality of our soil. One of the problems with rabbits is that their manure and urine is very high in nitrogen, which means it creates a big ammonia smell when it sits in piles. And rabbits defecate in the same place every time, so it creates these piles. This is a big problem in the industry and because those rabbits are breathing that air 24 hours a day and requires them to use antibiotics and coccidiostats. We didn't want to do that, but we still wanted to raise the rabbits. So we brought in something natural to counteract this problem. We brought in the chickens. The chickens mix the carbon, which can be wood chips, sawdust, hay, any kind of carbonaceous material, to bond with the rabbit manure and eliminate the smell problem. The chickens, looking for bugs and critters and antibodies, mix up the carbon and the rabbit manure and create compost. It's the best compost we make here. It grows incredible grass and eliminates the smell problem all in one big cycle. The chickens are satisfied and they are doing something that they do naturally and the rabbits aren't breathing that ammonia air 24 hours a day. So it's a win-win situation. By having the rabbits at eye level, it creates a lot of wasted space on the floor and we want to get as much utilization out of the building as possible. So by bringing the chickens in on the floor and adding that second tier of production, it allows us to get a lot more dollars out of a square foot. By the chickens adding eggs to the rabbit's meat, we can double the amount of dollars we can turn in a building. In a building the size of a two-car garage, which is room for 15 does and their bunnies and 150 chickens, we can net three to four thousand dollars in one year, just off the building the size of a two-car garage. Rabbits naturally reproduce the best in the spring and the summer when the temperature is about 65 to 70 degrees, which is their favorite. So keeping them at that temperature the, as long as possible keeps them breeding and reproducing at their peak. So we bring them into the hoop house during the winter and in open sheds during the summer. This keeps them in condition and ready to be bred. When we start breeding rabbits, it's important that the buck and the doe are healthy and in the right body condition. A doe is open about 25 out of 30 days and is normally ready to accept service. When you get into a larger operation, it's important to keep track of all the does and the bucks. When you have 80 does, it's important to keep track of what's going on and when as does are shifted from cage to cage. I keep track of my does and bucks in this type of system. This tag right here 
means that this is a buck and it's number four. Another tag, this would mean that this doe is number 76 and I can move this with the doe from cage to cage as she's moved. It's important to have the ratio of at least one buck per 10 does for adequate breeding and we always take the doe to the buck. So for transport, you grab a mature doe by the scruff of the neck and support her hindquarters and she'll ride that way to the buck's pen. Does are open about 25 out of 30 days and norm generally accept service. Mating takes just a few seconds. The buck mounts the doe. And in this case, the doe is not open and accepting service and hence is not bred and needs to be returned to the cage. She will be tr she we will try to breed her again tomorrow. That one didn't take. Let's give this one a try. As she raises her back in, there's the breed, right there. It was quick, as she raised her tail there, um, that was when the breed, and when he falls off dramatically like that, you know she's bred. Now, in four weeks, she will kindle. When the bunnies, when her bunnies are four, five weeks old, we will rebreed her, and then when the bunnies are six weeks old, we'll take the doe out of the bunnies, then they will be weaned, the doe will go to another cage and in three more weeks she will kindle again. The bunnies will stay in that cage for another seven weeks when they are then dressed at, at a total of 12 weeks. Now a couple days before the doe is supposed to kindle we need to give her a nest box. For these size meat rabbits, they need about 11 by 16 inch nest box with a wood floor with holes in it for drainage for the young bunnies. The bedding material is straw. You can use hay, but I've used straw. We put it in rough and the doe will make her own nest. She'll pull fur and make her own nest down in this straw to keep the young bunnies warm. Now that the doe is kindled, you can see how here she's pulled fur to keep the young bunnies warm. And these bunnies are about three to four days old. They're starting to get their fur and I can go in and check and count them. Four, five, six. Seven bunnies, that's a good litter. There's a lot of dates involved of taking care of a large herd of rabbits, kindling, weaning, dressing the fryers, and it's impossible to remember. So I've found the easiest way is to keep track with a small pocket calendar. I can look at all the dates with a moment's glance on one page. After the doe has been rebred when the bunnies are five weeks old, the bunnies stay with the doe for another week and then are weaned at six weeks. We wean by taking the doe from the bunnies not the other way around because that reduces the stress on the bunnies and that's a very critical time in their life at six weeks and they need to have as little stress as possible. So we take the doe away from them. The bunnies stay in that cage for another week. Then they're moved into a bulk pen where we take several litters and put them together so there's 30 or 40 in a group and they stay in here until they're 12 weeks old then they're dressed.
We believe that it's important for the animals to have the most natural diet possible. And in the case of the rabbits, it's green material. The problem is that the industry standard rabbits are so far removed from pasture that it's hard for them to ingest it. So if we found that the best way for them to receive grass and help supplement their pellets and cut their feed costs and produce a higher quality rabbit to, in the end is in the form of green chop. And it, whether it's grass, comfrey, anything that can be picked in a large quantity in a short amount of time and brought in to these bulk pens. During the winter months when green material, when you can't access green material, we can supplement good quality mold free hay, whether it be alfalfa, clover, lespedeza, any of those good quality species can, are, can be supplemented in the form of green material. To keep the does and bucks in the right body condition for breeding, they have to be fed the right amount of pellets. A mature doe weighing about 9 pounds should eat about 4 ounces of feed per day. Rabbits are very susceptible to heart attacks and have to be protected from the direct sunlight. So in the greenhouse, they have roofing on top of the cages to protect them from the direct sun. And when you have a large herd of rabbits, automatic water lines are the most time efficient way of watering the entire herd. Five gallon bucket with a hole in the bottom, plums right into your watering system and, wire, and waters the entire herd. I build all my own cages. This is a five foot long by 30 inch deep by 16 inch tall cage. It's divided in half so there's two compartments in the single cage, space for two does in one. The building material is one by two hardware cloth for the sides, the top, and the ends. The bottom, however, is made of one by half inch hardware cloth that's double dipped to stand up to the acidity of the rabbit urine. It would it lasts a lot longer than regular hardware cloth. The door latches are made out of regular spring latches. The feeders are five inch feeders and the whole thing is held together by J clips. All of these are accessible from rabbit supply houses. The rabbits are 12 weeks old and it's time for them to be processed. They've been in the bulk pens and it's time for them to come in and be dressed. It's important that we dress the rabbits a few days before we actually have to take them to market because rabbit is a lot like beef in that it needs to age to increase the quality of the meat. So we need to dress them a few days prior to sale and put them in the refrigerator for a few days. But before we start killing anything, it's important that we select a good quality dough to put back in as our replacement stock. So we need to tell the difference between the bucks and the does. First of all, you just grab the bunny by the scruff of the neck and support them on your leg. And you use your index finger to pull the tail down and bring your thumb back towards your body. If it protrudes or circles, it circles in the younger rabbits and protrudes in the older rabbits, this is a buck. You do the does in the same manner, except they show up in the form of a slit instead of circling or protruding. Now that we know the difference between the bucks and the does, it's important that we pick a rabbit for replacement that is of higher quality than the stock we're using now to keep the quality of the herd moving forward. So when we're picking a doe, you grab the friars by the hindquarters and not the scruff. You grab the scruff for the older rabbits. To pick a doe for replacement, it's important that she have a uniform body. You can see how this one is almost the same width from both the shoulder all the way back to the hindquarter. She's long from, from the loin, from the, between the shoulder and the hindquarter. She has good rounded hindquarters. She has good body condition. Her ears are good and straight and the same length. Her eyes are clear and an overall very healthy rabbit. She's also a little bit bigger than most of the other rabbits in the litter. So she's a good doe and an excellent one to save to replace some of your old stock. 
Just to give you an idea how important it is to go ahead and butcher the rabbit and take it to the customer yourself instead of selling it to a processor. If I were to sell the same rabbit to a processor, they pay about 75 cents a pound and they want a four and a half to five pound live rabbit, which equals about 350. If I were to take that same rabbit and process it right here, in two minutes, I can change that rabbit to being worth three dollars to being worth eight dollars by getting the entire consumer dollar just in two minutes and I can do 20 rabbits an hour that's a huge return to labor and well worth the time another major enterprise here at Polyface Farm is Piggerator pork when we began raising the pigs years ago we started with the pigs just to turn our compost doing the pigger rating in the barn to inject oxygen into the uh, compost bedding behind the cow. But then the meat was so good and the pork tasted so good, suddenly we had a tremendous market for the meat and so suddenly we found ourselves not in just raising a tool business, but actually raising uh, pork on a commercial scale for the market. Well that necessitated another model, another, another technique of being able to raise the pigs in a time when we didn't actually need them to work. So how could we raise them in a pig friendly way, in an environmentally friendly way that would allow us to continue to capitalize on the pig's desire and propensity to use that plow on the end of his nose and, um, and yet do some work for us. So we decided on the idea of a pig pasture and so we came up into the woods here, and uh, this was just woods, just like uh, all the, the trees around here. And we cleared off about two acres and divided the two acres up into one quarter acre paddocks. There are two strands of wire uh, defining the paddocks, and those wires are, are permanent wires. And the pigs actually root up a berm uh, against these wires, kind of like the edges of a rice paddy. Right now, we are in October. This is the second cycle through for the season. We run two cycles, two sets of pigs through in the season. We begin at one end and work to the far end of the, uh, of the pasture through, through these quarter acre paddocks. What we have found is that about one ton of grain supplement seems to mesh very well with the forage that one quarter acre can produce. If we give them uh, way too much grain in a feeder, then they actually denude the area too much and, and hurt it so that it can't come back as well. If we give them very little grain, then they grow slow, the meat's not quite as good. And so there's a real uh, delicate balance there between the amount of grain supplement they get, the amount of forage and exercise they get. And so the quarter acre paddock allows us to raise groups of anywhere from 30 to 40 uh, pigs in a group on a cell feeder with one ton of supplement. Every time that one ton of grain is gone, we then move them to the next paddock. So that grain becomes kind of our barometer, our constant in determining when the move has to occur. And so when we move them, we let the grain run out for a day so they get hungry and then they immediately want to go into the next paddock. Through this system, running two cycles a year, two batches of pigs a year, we have roughly um, anywhere from eight to 12 weeks of rest after each cycle. And then of course there's nothing here in the winter time. We shut all this down in the winter time. And the result is that we can raise from 60 to 80 pigs through this two acre pasture uh, area of course it's kind of a savanna now there are new trees coming up we raise these two cycles through here uh, in a year which at a at a uh, net of about 100 to 200 dollars per pig depending on how well they do and, and what the market is for that particular set of pigs um, we can actually net out about three thousand dollars an acre on this paddock meanwhile the pigs are tilling it they're bringing on different species. It's revegetating naturally. We did plant annuals, but we found that the perennials encroached and came in. The grasses come in. This is rough ground. All this is is just 
the trees off, you can still see the stumps. There's a, it's very rocky, it's very rugged ground, and yet the pigs are very much at home here, and, uh, and it is gradually uh, building up with a greater, greater amount of, uh, of forage cover and vegetation on the landscape. It works real well, the pigs are healthy, there's no smell because of the constant rotation. The supplement that we're giving the pigs in the feeder is primarily corn, roasted uh, soybeans, and oats, and seaweed, uh, a mineral uh, supplement as well. And so uh, it's a fairly coarse feed, it's not finely ground, it's fairly coarse, and um, the, the oat husks help to keep the pigs parasite free. The reason that we want the pigs out here, as opposed to a confinement, of course, is so that they get to exercise the fresh air, the sunshine, that make the meat a more, a more solid, uh, a more muscled uh, type of meat, as opposed to a very soft, bland type of meat. The whole idea here is nutrition, flavor, and quality of the finished product, and using the animal, uh, using the animal's assets as, as an asset, as a landscape builder, as a landscape asset, as the animal is being produced. Allowing the animal to reach their physiological potential and, uh, and allowing the landscape then to be changed to something more productive than it was in the beginning. The daily maintenance requirement here is very minimal. We only come and check on them about twice a week just to make sure their water's working and their feeder's working. What we have here is a pond that we put in uh, that gravity feeds water down into, these, into the paddock. So every paddock has a, has a gravity fed uh, nipple water supply. There's a T post in the corner of each paddock and we just slip the nipple down over that uh, T post. And so we just check on them twice a week, make sure everybody's here, check spark, make sure the spark's here. Uh, maybe clean off the solar charger a little bit so that it makes sure it recharges the battery and um, make sure no bears have been around uh, harassing the pigs and, and they're all in and quiet and happy. There's very, very little. This is almost a, a, a self-sustaining system except about every 10 to 20 days when that ton of feed is gone, then we have to move them. That's when the big, uh, that's when the big maintenance comes. It takes about, oh, an hour or so to do the whole thing we just roll the feeder into the next paddock, take the spark out of the wire, mash the fence down with a couple of rocks. The pigs follow the feeder. Remember, we've, we've uh, emptied the feeder so they don't have any feed for a day, so they're hungry. They naturally want to follow the feeder. We come in with the feed buggy, auger the feed in, the pigs move into the next paddock, move their water, and it's all, once the feeder's full, come out, put up all the fences, and go home. So it's a very simple, uh, low labor type of uh, approach to pig production. In the winter time when we begin feeding hay, we bring the cattle into a hay shed in order to protect the 50 pounds of manure and urine that each animal is putting down from either vaporization or leaching. A good farm will never have any odors from vaporization of its nutrients or leaching into the groundwater and into the bays. We tie down these nutrients with carbon. And this carbon can be you know, wood chips, sawdust, straw, old hay, corn fodder, corn cobs, uh, whatever, but, but carbonaceous material. We lay that in incrementally. Uh, after we lay down some corn, and the corn will ferment, of course, to, to pay the pig salary when they aerate it and compost it, but we lay that in and just keep building and adding additional uh, inches of material to this, to this, uh, to the manure and the urine that the cattle are dropping. That keeps them extremely dry, clean, warm, and makes a wonderful deep anaerobic bedding pack to protect all these wonderful nutrients for further composting. The whole hay feeding system that we use in our hay shed operates based on this vertically portable uh, feeder, we call it a feeder gate, you can call it whatever you want to, feed rack, feed gate, hay gate, everybody has a different name for it.
but it's something that uh, dad came up with years ago as a way to feed hay very efficiently in the in the winter time what we've got is we've got a basically a top plate and a bottom plate uh, these are poles here it can be pipe it could be a, a a four by four, whatever, but anyway, you've got a top and a bottom, and then you've got V slots coming down so as they can put their heads in and eat and eat through the top of through the top of the uh, V. Now, it is cantilevered. See, it's not straight up and down, it's cantilevered. That way they can't back up far enough to poop over into the hay. What we're after here, it accomplishes many things. Uh, one of the things that it accomplishes is that the cattle don't have access to their hay so they can't manure it and soil uh, that hay and re-ingest parasites. Secondly, it's by having to put their heads in up high and bring them down here to eat, it keeps the cattle from uh, going in, backing out, going in, backing out, so it reduces hay wastage that, that occurs in so many feeding systems. Of course, the most wasteful is out in the field where they just tromp through it. And then the next thing that it does, so, so it's hygienic, it's waste free, and the next thing is that we can raise and lower this. You see the, you see the, uh, the arm up here, and then there's another, there's another um, uh, angle iron on the back of these posts with notches in it, and the, so the bottom, see the chain here, the bottom actually hangs on, on this, um, on this notched piece. So we can actually raise and lower the entire gate. We can raise it and lower it four feet to accommodate the bedding buildup. And then to, so to feed the hay, everything is very simple. We just drop the hay right into the gate. The cattle come in and, uh, and eat. And there's a slot here for every single, for every single animal. So every single animal has a, has a spot to eat. The being able to move it up and down allows us to let this bedding build up. And um, of course the bedding, the whole, the whole idea here is to get these animals inside during the dormant season when the soil, which is not alive and it's, it's sleeping because of winter, when that soil cannot metabolize the nutrients those cattle are dropping. Those cattle are dropping 50 pounds of material out their back end every day. And that material is highly unstable. If it gets dry, it wants to vaporize off in the air, and we all know what that smells like. And if it gets wet, it wants to leach into the groundwater, and we all know what that does to our groundwater streams and bays. And so um, a, a proper farm, a farm that's, that's environmentally friendly and, and socially responsible, a moral, ethical farm will A, it'll never smell, B, it will not lose any nutrients into the groundwater and on the runoff. And so during that, that dormant season, what we want to do is try to protect as much of that manure as possible just under these uh, awnings and, um, and the feeder gates allow us to feed very efficiently uh, in that kind of approach. We have these 80 some calves in this, uh, in the barn, in the facility, and we confine their water. We buy a lot of calves at the stockyard. Okay, well, our receiving program for these calves from the stockyard is we, uh, we control their water. So uh, I'll just start this. This is a, this is a uh, water system that just comes from the well at the house. And, uh, it's a 300 gallon tank, so it'll take them half a day. And then what we do is uh, we worm with Shackley Basic H soap. Uh, no reason to put them in the head gate. Put a little bit of soap in the water, and that uh, it'll actually it'll actually suds right up. You can actually <laughs> it'll look like uh, dish water. But uh, that soap will help them to uh, get rid of their to get rid of their uh, parasites, and then we use Willard's water, which is a catalyst altered water. We put a little bit of that in, 
and that uh, reduces their, their toxins. In other words, the average person who buys a calf from the sale barn is going to put uh, a bunch of vaccinations, medications, and things into that, into that animal to keep it alive because of the stress of the sale barn and the, and the stockyard. And so we do these preventive measures, uh, biological preventive measures to strengthen the immune system and help the animal to uh, help the animal to thrive without the, all the medications and the shots. We give the calves mineral in order to again increase their immune system, and this mineral has um, is our own kind of our own formulation, our own combination of things. It starts with Nutribalancer, which is primarily food grade soft rock phosphate, and then uh, kelp meal is in there as well, seaweed, and then to get them started on it real well, we add some, we add some uh, molasses to make it uh, sweet so they'll start, and then we gradually back that off. We don't put any salt in it during the winter because they get salt in their hay. We use salt as a preservative on the hay, but in the summertime, we, we mix the salt, the kelp, and the Nutribalancer together in order to, uh, in order to have a ration that that uh, keeps their immune system real high and up and running. The immune system really functions with the minerals, the carbon, and the feed itself. So we have all those different components taken care of in the water and in the mineral box. When we talk about farm buildings, we want to think several things. One is function over form, and the second one is multiple use. And so when we look at this uh, hay shed, what we call the hay shed, it actually has many uses. It's strictly a pole construction, and even for the rafters, we're using just uh, low, uh, oak poles out of the, out of the uh, wood lot. And of course, that increases the value of the poles because we're replace, We're basically using firewood <laughs> for a rafter. And then if you'll notice the skylights, we have a lot of skylights in here. And those skylights are essential for maintaining sanitation because it's the ultraviolet light that kills the pathogens in the, in the bedding. So we want a tremendous amount of light. We want a st structure just that's as, as functional as can be. I realize, you know, it's, it's cheap, but it's functional. The cows don't care if they have pole rafters. And then multi-purpose. We have pigs. Um, we have cows in here now. We can have pigs in there. Of course, we have sawdust uh, piled, wood chips, straw, hay. And during the summertime, we put poultry panels in here and raise chickens in here. When the pigs come out, we hang rabbit cages over those. And so the whole structure serves multiple species of animals at different times of the year, multiple, multiple use. When the cows go out then in the spring, back out to grazing on grass, then we come in to that bedded area with the pigs. And uh, the pigs, of course, are going after this fermented grain, which is down in the bedding pack. Now, as they, as they till this, that grain, of course, producing their salary, as they till this, they're aerating it. And as they aerate it, it injects the oxygen for the decomposition. See, just a couple of weeks ago, this was cow manure and urine. There's wood chips, straw, old hay, and that carbon and uh, unstable nutrients are now decomposing aerobically and the pigs are doing all the work and they actually enjoy it. We're actually allowing the pigs to use the plow on the end of their nose to allow them, them to fully express their physiological distinctiveness. The reason farmers don't like to do large-scale composting is because of the materials handling and all of the, the uh, tractors and equipment and petroleum to do the work. But if we let animals do the work, suddenly we don't need to generate all the cash to replace the, the oil and the fuel and the parts and the machinery. In other words, as soon as we let animals do the work, 
the profit potential on the farm becomes size neutral because we do not have to generate the cash to replace the things that rot, rust, and depreciate. So it completely changes the economics of the farm and allows us to fully capitalize on the nutrients that we have. We want to capture every nutrient that we have on the farm. So this actually gets very warm it, it, and, uh, and completely changes. There's, there's already no smell uh, in, this, in, the, in the material as it aerobically composts. Then when we spread it back out on the fields, if it's a sunny day, there's no odor because there's no vaporization of the nutrients because the nutrients are now tied up in the bodies of the microbes that did the decomposition, so it stabilizes those nutrients. If we spread on a rainy day, the nutrients don't leach into the groundwater, so they all stay right on the farm and right here where we, want, where we can recycle them and capture them back into the soil. The pigs are going after the fermented grain, which is down in the bedding. The bedding has actually uh, ensiled because it's anaerobic since the cows tromped out the oxygen. But you've got wood chips here, you've got old hay, some straw. But see, you can see the corn that's down in this fermented bedding, and that corn actually, actually gets so. Look, look at that. See, I can actually squeeze, I can actually squeeze the juice out of that and break that. It's, it's just like rubber, there it is. It just, it'll just break right open like rubber. And, and that actually releases the sugars. See, that's real malleable. I can just break that open. It's not hard corn anymore. It's real uh, sugary as that corn has fermented. And that's the paycheck, that's the salary that those pigs get for doing their work. When we talk about forestry, which is a pretty big part of Polyface Farm since we have 450 acres of woodlands, we talk about upland deciduous hardwoods. Upland deciduous hardwoods come back uh, on their own volition after a cut. And so what we have found to be the most effective is to go in and identify a spot that, that ought to be harvested and harvest it completely. Uh, the industry term for this, of course, is a clear cut. But what we, when we talk about clear cut, we're talking about maybe one acre or at the most two acres. Very, very small, complete openings to allow everything equal access. What this does is it allows the brambles and the young saplings to have full sunlight and come back. The single biggest determinant of the growth of which species on the ground is the amount of light penetration in the forestal canopy. That's what regulates germination, species, all of those kind of things. Brambles and, and early species, pioneer species, require 100% sunlight. So generally, this has been cut now for three years. This is third year growth. And what you see are, are brambles and weeds. It's already gone through its weed stage. And so by next year, the weeds essentially will be gone, the brambles will be gone, and we'll see more and more of these locusts, the little oak trees, which are under the locusts, and the, the red maples and the early species. A forest has a succession. It's always moving from, from one successional phase to another successional phase. And as a result of that, that uh, species uh, complexion, as it changes over time, uh, that is why we want to open up these areas and allow the full light penetration and allow the full successional speciation to occur. That gives us the, great amount, the greatest amount of diversity and the greatest uh, productivity in terms of allowing all the different species to go through their cycle and express themselves. When we talk about wildlife browse and the impact that the, that the opening has on the wildlife, we can look at these new little uh, three-year-old, uh, this is a, an oak, oak sapling, and you can see the, the uh, terminal buds here have been browsed off. You can see one um, right here, and we can actually tell the, the impact of the wildlife and whether the wildlife has enough to eat or not 
by how far down the twigs they graze. If they just nip off these tips, we know that they're getting plenty to eat. Now, here's, here's a tip that's a natural tip, you notice, that hasn't been grazed off at all. This little tree here has been completely freed from the browsing. Now, we don't know which one of these, of these little saplings is going to end up, whether it'll be this chestnut oak or this red oak or, or some other oak that comes up in here. We don't know which of these oaks will end up being the dominant stand, the dominant tree 60 years from now. But right now, all we want is as many of them to sprout as possible to allow all the, the genetic diversity to uh, play itself out in this, in this new forest that's sprouting up from, from the forest floor. These locust trees, of course, which are overtopping these little saplings right now, the locust trees require a lot more sunlight and they are very short-lived. We call them pioneer species and they only live for about 30 to 60 years. So this, this locust then provides shade so that these oak trees will grow tall and straight. Otherwise, they'll be what we call wolf trees where they, they grow uh, real spread out and not as good for making lumber. And so the locust tree actually acts as a nurse tree, a nurse tree to protect these oaks from too much sunlight and allow the oaks to grow in a more, uh, in a more shaded area. The oak trees only need about 30% sunlight to grow very well. The locust tree needs about 100% sunlight. So again, light is the determining factor for what grows and what gets a chance to really express its physiological um, uh, distinctiveness to the greatest degree. Since we've reforested everything that should have never been uncovered in the first place, now we're beginning to deforest or reopen some areas that are very conducive to small pastures, open land, and things like that. Again, to create a tremendous amount of edge effect and diversity within the landscape so that, so that there's open forest riparian, open forest riparian, and it moves with the topography on the berm lines, these, these key lines. So we're opening this up now, this, this entire area, as a new pig pasture. You notice we're leaving some saplings for shade for the pigs. These will continue to grow up. We're leaving any kind of nut producing trees like persimmons or walnuts or mulberries or anything like that. And, um, and of course the first thing that will come up are these little blueberry, blueberry plants. The pigs of course will enjoy eating the blueberries for a couple of years as this gradually makes its transition over to perennial forages as we've seen in the other uh, pig pastures. Now the way this works to describe the landscape is this is a ridge top behind us and if we move over here we will see the edge of a ravine. And this is the new this will be the edge of the field right here. We let the we let the topography define where that uh, where the edge of the field is going to be. We, we don't believe in, uh, in square fields. We want a lot of ins and outs and following the terrain. And so that berm line uh, is going to define where the edge of the field is. So we're continuing to cut. We're continuing to cut the wood down into the ravine because those trees are mature, they're not growing, a lot of them are diseased, they're crooked. We need to start over. And so we'll, we'll cut down into the ravine a little clear cut but that will be fenced out and it will go through the natural forestal revegetation, early succession, brambles, berries, uh, bear and deer and, and turkey food, and, and gradually turn back into hardwoods on the, on the side of this field. So we, so we have a kidney bean shaped field with a, a newly uh, cut ravine in the middle coming back with early successional forest with a kind of open land pig pasture savanna around it letting the terrain define what's open and what's forested, creating more diversity, more edge effect, more multiple use and beauty in the landscape. We're gonna take this tree down next 
and uh, it's not really big enough for a saw log. It's close, but not quite big enough for a saw log. Pretty much anything we can make a good eight, eight inch by eight inch cant out of, we take for a saw log. We're gonna bring it my way, so we're gonna hinge it on this side and then cut it in the back. The, the, one of the critical elements here that I wanna show is that uh, we, we can cut the stump fairly high, but then we want to cut the stump right down and actually shave it right down to the ground. That way, when sprouts come up from this tree and regrowth comes up from this tree, they're actually coming up from the root crown and there's not a distance of cambium. This part of the tree will die, but the roots, which are down in the ground, essentially will never die. And so what we end up with then is a stump that's right down flush to the ground and of course, I, I realize that taking that extra care to cut down low is a little bit uh, tedious, uh, cutting this extra amount off. But when you're done, you really have a, a, a beautiful stump. And when you look across the, you know, the finish, the landscape, uh, the stumps are essentially not noticeable and you can just drive over them and, and it makes a, a beautiful thing. And then these sprouts, these sprouts will come right up from the o o edges here and uh, directly up from the root crown so there's there's no uh, cambium that will eventually, you know, when the sprout gets yay big, uh, that can break off. It'll be a nice healthy new stump growth use, utilizing the uh, old root crown that was in the tree. So one of the points of, of working in the woodlot is we may not go as fast as some people, but what we want is an aesthetically pleasing landscape when we're done. That's why we stack branches. Uh, the branch piles act as a wildlife uh, haven and a place for rabbits and moles and voles and, and bugs and things to, uh, to live on. It takes a little extra time, but it, it creates a, a wonderfully more bountiful uh, forestal area and a more aesthetically pleasing area too, and more productive because the regrowth is going to be uh, coming right off of the old root crowns. Now, from a stewardship standpoint, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that if we multi-generationally for, let's just say, 200, 300, 400 years, harvest the best and leave the poorest, that we're going to end up with only the poorest in our woods. And so, uh, we, are, we are products of that and our forest land is, is like that. So how do we determine uh, what to do with a particular site? That's what I want to talk about for just a moment. And I also want to talk about how to identify healthy trees and sick trees. For example, if we look at this tree right here, one of the telltale signs of a tree that's in decline is an expanded bowl. When we see when we see the, uh, the bowl, this is, this is called the bowl of the tree, this bottom part. When we see the bowl expand and at swelling, just as if you sprained your ankle and it swells because it's inflamed and hurting, that's the same thing that's going on with this tree. It's inflamed, it's hurting, and it's already setting in rot coming up into the, into the tree. In fact, you can see the other part of the fork, this is a forked tree, and if we move to this fork, you see where the bugs and the, and the birds are already beginning to, to take their toll on it. Another telltale sign of a tree that's in decline is to look at the top of the tree, at the canopy, and see how many dead branches there are. You see a dead branch right there at about uh, 15 feet, a big one there at about uh, 20 feet, and as you go on up the tree, the, uh, the you see dead branches and in fact the canopy begins to sag and when a tree grows healthy the canopy uh, stays very upright. The branches are at fairly sharp angles as they reach to the light and they're, they're trying to find that light. As it ages those branches begin to sag out and so that instead of having a very upright uh, physiology, physique, it, it begins to sag and the branches become more horizontal coming out of the tree. Trees are living organisms. That means they live, they, they grow, and they die. And so the best thing is to harvest these trees before they actually go into decline and die and fall over and rot. I mean, the resources here to utilize, there's no sense in, uh, in losing the resource we might as well go ahead and use it. Now, trees are measured by diameter at breast height. And that's, of course, here's your, your chest. And so normally when you're measuring trees, you're measuring them diameter at breast height. 
that's how foresters, it's called DBH. And, what, and the, the amount of area that the tree op, uh, occupies is called basal area. Now when we're, when we're um, culling trees, the rule of thumb is that if you can't sit between the fork, either take them both or neither. Because if you take this one, rot will set into this one. If I take this one off, rot will set into this one. So what we want to do is, um, is either take them both or neither one if, if, we, if there's not a lot of distance between the two forks. Now, if we go to one that does work, uh, we'll come right up here to this one. Now when we come to this tree, we notice that it has, of course, uh, re-sprouted just like you would normally see a, a tree sprout, or maybe it was a brand new tree after, after this was cut. There are certainly stumps here that have been cut. This was probably cut over in the 1940s, about 60 years ago, and high graded. And they left all the junk trees and took the very best. But this tree came up, and you notice how uh, this fork, which at one time was much bigger than this one, is actually the one that has died here in the natural uh, kind of self-pruning process. Now, this, uh, this fork here and this one are closely related and do not, do not fit that rule of being able to sit down between them. So I'd want to take both of these off. However, on the other side, right here, the other main fork, which is growing very nicely, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it's growing nicely, has good form, the canopy is healthy. This one, I can sit down in between. So that means I can take off these two and leave this one in a, in a good stewardship pruning type of way, or as some you know, silviculturalists call it, a, a, uh, a weeding uh, opportunity so that I can uh, leave one and take the poorest. And then I can actually upgrade rather than downgrade the woodlot. Now if we look at this little white oak here, this is about an 8 inch DBH uh, tree. Pretty good form, nice and straight. Growing fairly well. Well let's say that we had a whole bunch of these around pretty close. The rule of thumb is for knowing how much to clean out is you take the diameter at breast height, which in this case would be eight inches, multiply by two and turn it into feet. So in this case it would be eight times two would be 16 and that would be 16 feet from this tree, which means we would cut this little dead dogwood sprout. We would probably, we would take down this uh, uh, white oak that's behind this one to allow this one to, to fully express itself. This little red maple back here, this little red maple over here, and so we would clean out 16 feet. As long as we don't violate that rule, then we will not get epicormic sprouting from this tree. If we go farther than that, we're going to allow too much light, then suddenly we're going to stimulate new germination of new saplings on the, on the floor, and we're going to get a fuzzy growth, we're going to get epicormic sprouting on this tree. So that's the thinning rule, and it, it can only be done, it only works real well, if we have enough in the residual stand to justify it. And one of the problems in these high-graded upland hardwood areas of the mid-Atlantic region is that typically we do not have enough of these type of trees in order to justify what's called a timber stand improvement or a TSI. And so generally we opt for the small little uh, openings, the small little clear cuts so that we can start everything over and release all the genetic base that's in that, that's in that soil rather than only releasing the genetic base that happens to be here right now, which typically are the, are the, the uh, cast-offs from the previous harvest cycle through high grading. The portable bandsaw mill has completely revolutionized the ability for a small farm like us to turn our raw uh, logs into lumber. The whole idea is that the head moves across the log and the log is able to sit stationary rather than the log moving across a stationary blade. 
And uh, making lumber out of logs is really, uh, it, it's a skill and an art as well. But the, the idea here is to value add this, this, all this wonderful raw material, to uh, value add it to make lumber either for ourselves, for our own building projects, or to sell. And of course, in addition, uh, this allows us to rejuvenate the woodlot and have a new generation of trees coming on. For the forest is a renewable resource. That's the beauty of wood. It's a renewable resource. This is, this is uh, solar energy, stored solar energy that we can turn into useful material. Relationship marketing is the phrase we use to describe our selling plan. The crux of our marketing effort is to build relationships between producer and consumer, creating intimacy that encourages accountability, knowledge, and appreciation. Our first step is to offer the highest quality food possible in taste, nutrition, and texture. Dedication to excellence is what guarantees that our products cannot be duplicated in a laboratory or a factory farm. Once we had models in place that produced consistently superior food, the second step was to get it into people's mouths. Samples work. It's as simple as going to the next door neighbor, knocking on the door and saying, I have the world's best whatever, and offering it to them. From those first samples comes a patron base that can be expanded by turning them into evangelists for you. We reward folks with freebies when they recommend new customers. Remember that it is easier to find 100 people who will spend $1,000 with you than 1,000 people who will spend $100. The hard part is getting the customer. Once the customer has made the investment in time, money, and emotion to darken your door, Offering additional items makes the whole visit more rewarding. 40% of our sales is from patrons coming out to the farm and purchasing, about 400 families. Another 40% of our sales is through restaurants. We supply nearly 40 restaurants, delivering once a week through a subcontractor who right now is my brother Art. We add a delivery fee based on volume and mileage, and that all goes to the delivery subcontractor. This system doesn't compromise our on-farm price, encourages the delivery person to sell as much as possible, and encourages the restaurant to buy more to get a lower delivery rate. We do not give volume discounts because we're in the food crafting business, and it's not cheaper by the million. Our production and processing models are knowledge and labor dense, aspects of a more biological system as opposed to an industrial system. From time to time, we've also participated in farmer's markets, either directly or through an agent. Nationwide, farmer's markets are dominated by fruits, nuts, and vegetables, which are freer from oppressive government regulations. Furthermore, shoppers often combine recreation with the excursion and do not want to risk keeping frozen meat in the car for several hours. We continue to dabble in this venue but find it quite a challenge. The final marketing venue we utilize is Metropolitan Buying Clubs. We believe this is a wave of the future as the organic movement becomes more and more compromised through government intervention and empire expropriation. Buying clubs are simply groups of people who buy collaboratively, using the volume to build efficient transportation into the direct service system. Metropolitan consumers are hard to reach with relationship marketing because the cost of delivering small volumes direct from the farm is prohibitive. But group volume changes the, the logistics, creating efficient delivery opportunities and enables these urban patrons to opt out of the compromised organic supermarket, building integrity back into their food. Really, our marketing effort has four supporting legs, on-farm sales, restaurants, farmers markets, and buying clubs. Each has an upside and a downside, but diversification of product and patron creates a healthy, balanced environment. Marketing is such an integral part of what we do here at Polyface Farm in addition to the production and the processing. It allows us to reach our community with good nutritious food and touch our landscape 
in a really positive, aesthetically and aromatically pleasing way. We appreciate you allowing us to touch you with this video, maybe present some information you haven't seen before, and allow us to visit with you a little bit. We trust that if you would like to come and visit, you will. If you would like more detailed, in-depth information, you will find the books that we have written, seminars that we offer, field days that we offer, all of that will be listed in the credits at the end of this video. Thank you for letting us spend this time with you. God bless you.